Erickson in the School of uh, Fine Arts um, and the Interactive Media Studies program here at Miami University. And I actually just wanted to start off with a quote from Marshall McLuhan that I think really kind of lands at uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, this idea that uh, there isn't much of a difference between entertainment and education is essential to uh, the basic philosophy. So I'm just going to get right into it. I'm going to warn you, I talk very quickly and I have lots of slides. So you'll see 70 slides in the next 15 minutes. Um, so the first concept is that games are practice. And we practice things like following directions. We practice things like solving problems. We practice things like understanding lies from truth in poker. Uh, we, un we practice things like physical prowess and things like the Olympics. Uh, and then you kind of fill in the blank for Twister. Uh, we also have um, uh, a lot of what we're interested in practicing is about survival. So it's basic sort of uh, survival skills. So here we have some kids playing tap. Uh, and the real concept here is that much of what we practice in games is essential to survival. Games are about practicing things that we need in order to survive. Uh, and this is really Noah Falstein's concept of uh, natural funnitivity. The things that we find fun often have a real life application. So uh, the game of tag is really a game about hunting or being hunted. Uh, the interesting thing about games is that they are kind of safe place. So uh, we can experiment in a game and not worry about hurting ourselves. It's a great place to try new things and make mistakes. Uh, and that sense of having fun really kind of uh, helps that occur. So here's a great way to practice fine motor skills without hurting anybody, right? Um, operation. Uh, and then we also have this concept of um, digital games giving us sort of the ultimate opportunity uh, to practice through simulation. So um, we can practice driving. We can practice golfing. We can practice swinging a racket. And we can even practice getting our friends to help us meet our own needs in Farmville. So the first question for me um, in this sort of inquiry-based um, approach is, what's so special about digital games? Why is it that digital games seem to afford some things that traditional analog games don't? And so there are some obvious answers. The first obvious answer is, there's no scraped knees, there's no million dollar destruction, and there's no lives lost. So I can blow things up. I can fly an airplane, I can do all kinds of things that in the real world might be very, very costly. But there are some more complicated um, responses, <laughs> like an emotional response, right, which does have a kind of consequence to it. So it's really interesting that we're so invest invested in these games that we actually have these kinds of expressions while playing. So the second um, sort of thing that distinguishes digital games from other games is this fact that computers don't tire. Um, we can do things over and over and over and over again and the computer doesn't get bored with it, unlike some of our friends who might say, do we really have to play tag again? So we can collect pellets over and over and over again, and we can, collect, we can dodge cars and Frogger, um, or we can save the world from countless evil creatures. And the computer never tires. Um, we usually tire before it does. So what we do in digital games is really, really supportive of repeated practice. We try it over and over and over again. So the experiment um, is also much more restricted in a digital game than it is in some um, analog games. There's a couple of reasons for that. First, games are designed by um, people like Will Wright. And they're designed spaces. Um, a lot of what Will Wright sees as essential to the world is then essential to a game world. Um, and it's true of homes as well, right? So homes are designed spaces as well. And this is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, Falling Water. And so if you think about it, game designers are really kind of architects, like Frank Lloyd Wright, but architects of experience. They're creating experiences for us. So this is The Sims, one of Will Wright's biggest successes. And we're basically learning how to sort of manage these Sims lives. Uh, and a lot of the values, a lot of what um, Will Wright defines as sort of essential to living is in this game. Sometimes it's about getting your Sim a brand new TV. Sometimes it's about your Sim socializing. But it's got a real sense of sort of philosophical value um, and uh, a set of sort of values and perspectives prescribed by Will Wright. So the idea is that game models, um, games have models of value and perspective. So uh, if we think about um, these two basic philosophies for um, these two constructed um, experiences, we have Falling Water, which is largely about an integration with nature, and then we have Sonic the Hedgehog, which is largely about collecting gold rings and moving very quickly. So what's interesting about digital games is they don't afford us the ability to bend the rules the way interpersonal gaming does. So if I play an analog game with someone, I can often say, well, you're a lot younger than me, so I'm going to change the rules to benefit you. Uh, games can do this. We call it rubber banding. 
Uh, but this sense of negotiating new social or gameplay contracts is much rarer in games than it is in sort of everyday uh, analog play. So how many ways can we play tag, for example? There's freeze tag, there's you know, all kinds of different ones. Uh, and then think of, uh, if you ever talk to someone who's played Monopoly, you'd be surprised at how different the rules are between families. Um, and uh, if you also think of things like Foursquare, a game that allows you to make the rules as you play, and the reward for playing and playing well is that you get a new rule to incorporate into the general um, game set. That's really interesting. Uh, so I have this sort of essential question. Um, how does that affect our view of the everyday? So if we practice all of these things in digital games every day, uh, what kinds of things are we learning, or at least what kinds of things are we practicing? Because we can't forget that games impart values, and they help us practice. So, you could ask questions about whether or not people are seeking points and badges in their own lives. Maybe. Maybe. Um, or, if they have a, a new sort of um, game-informed, digital game-informed relationship to the tools, the everyday, um, and the way that they solve problems. You can also ask questions about the roles we choose to play. So every game presentation has to have one slide of War, World of Warcraft, so I just made a point of putting it in there. Um, and then, uh, ultimately, the real question is, uh, if we practice this, um, what do we find useful? So uh, as game players, we're always looking for that sense of natural funnativity, even if we're not uh, completely aware of it. And so the question is, what is, what is sort of useful in my everyday? And what's interesting is useful changes as we age, as our social situations change, as our experience changes, responsibilities in our lives, etc. So, here's the big question. What if we began to critique the games we play? And so, what if we made games to practice other skills? Skills that are naturally fun, or part of natural funnativity, but address different issues in our everyday. So what if we understood our needs to survive as something that evolved? So as we got older, we started saying, or as we got more mature as game players, uh, we start saying, what else do I need to practice other than shooting things? And so that's where sort of my practice of critical gameplay comes in. Very simply, um, critical game, gameplay is about trying to understand other ways that we can play games. So here, for example, um, this is an example of uh, a question I asked. I sort of wondered, do we need to practice more affection between people, or at least affection within um, the context of helping someone out? Uh, so I created this simple game. Uh, basically, the way it's played is you have a 30-inch teddy bear that you must hug at the appropriate times in order to help the teddy bear get through. Um, so he gets obstacles, and then those obstacles uh, are the only way to sort of support him is to just give him a big bear hug. Uh, and it's interesting because it's actually um, it's uh, sensor-based, so there's, there's sort of degrees of hugging. Um, so there's a really big hug or a little hug, uh, and you can give lots of little hugs to get through certain things, and then really big hugs to get through tougher situations. So then the next question is sort of like, maybe we need to practice think thinking about everyone as opposed to thinking about ourselves. I find that a lot of games are about a single, um, either a single mission uh, with a bunch of people collaborating for it, or a single character who needs to meet one particular goal. So I created this game, uh, which I'm currently calling All for One, and the way this one works is essentially you've got uh, multiple characters per level, and all of those characters are controlled by a single control. So if you move left, they all move left. You move right, they all move right. And you're trying to get them through exits. So what's happening is you have to resolve um, how sort of finding the mutually beneficial sol solution or the solution that's optimal for every um, uh, non-player or player character in the scene. Uh, then there's also the sense of uh, maybe we need to practice helping others a bit more and undoing mistakes because there isn't a ton of that opportunity in gaming right now. Uh, and so I created this game uh, based on uh, a, uh, one of the largest massacres in history. Essentially, uh, it happened uh, between the Japanese and Chinese uh, in Nanjing. And what this game allows you to do is instead of most games which have you shooting and recreating um, sort of atrocities, or war, you're undoing it. So you have the ability to revive all of these people, and so you're constantly just trying to save as many people as this sort of screen scrolls by. There's also this sort of, um, I think, slightly more uh, romantic or nostalgic sense of maybe we just need to practice slowing down and enjoying our everyday experiences. So uh, this game, which is one of the oldest of the set, uh, is basically about um, stopping to, to see the flowers. So what happens here is you're left in a field, and every time you move, the, the world sort of disappears. 
but the longer you wait, the more the world appears. And if you wait too long, then the world also starts to disappear, so it's always a sort of balancing doing and seeing perpetually. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, a need to sort of practice things like understanding good and bad beyond appearance. We're very, very stuck on this idea that bad guys always look one way and good guys always look the other. Uh, so what I did is I created uh, a game that's uh, sort of very close to, say, Super Mario Brothers or another platform scroller, except that every character, non-player and player, looks exactly the same. The only way you can tell the difference between the characters is if you um, approach them and watch their change in behavior instead of appearance. Uh, this game is very, very simple. Uh, I just looked at sort of one of the oldest, um, oldest games for most people's sort of recent history, um, George Higgin Higginbottom's Pong, and said, well, Pong was always sort of competitive. So what if we made it cooperative and turned it into a game of pass? And the, the obstacle, the, the sort of the obstruction to our goal is that we can't pass naturally. The computer actually sort of randomly directs where the ball is passed. So you're always trying to communicate with each other and kind of cooperate because the game only is perpetuated if you can both catch the ball. Uh, and then I also thought it'd be interesting to look at things like simplification instead of complication. So um, sort of borrowing from the Buddhist sense of detachment, uh, I thought it would be interesting to create a game that's sort of anti-collecting. Every time you collect a coin, it slows you down and it weighs you down. So what you're doing in this game, which is only five levels, is you're constantly trying to avoid coins. And as you uh, matriculate through the level system, you discover that the coins get more aggressive and that you actually have to sort of like run away from them. Um, and that you actually uh, get the opportunity to give your coins away. So then you're looking for people who can take your coins from you, who need coins for some reason. Uh, and so I just sort of want to end with a take-home question, and that take-home question is, um, what have you practiced today? That's it.